So the first item on the agenda, Don, um, I've gotten an email from Ryan just about the work you're doing with him on the zoning map. So I just wanted to sort of check in to see where that stood and um, like, yeah, where that stands. Well, I, my last um, interaction with him was I, I had sent him all of the information that I have and uh, told him to get in touch with me if I did, he had any questions. Uh, it looks like much of the stuff is on the, uh, the digital map on the website, on the Waitley website. So um, I'll get in touch with him and see if he's got any more questions, but um, things are looking pretty good. Which digital map on the Waitley website, Don? Uh, the uh, property map, zoning, property zoning. It's, it's, it's a multi-use map at this point. Okay. So that's been updated. Yes. If you go over that's to the left hand, left hand side, you can. Yeah, I know where to find it. Does okay. it include the aquifer overlay district? Um, I just took a glance on it. And I don't know if it does include that, but he's got the, the GIS information for that. So I can confirm that Ryan wrote to me to say that He's waiting to hear back from you, Don, and he sent this to me on the 16th of the month, so six days ago. He's waiting to hear back, and it does seem like he has questions related to the Aquifer Protection Overlay District. Okay, well, I did answer him in saying that it, it was uh, in the GIS files. So okay. All right. Well, it would be worth just closing the loop because as of the 16th of February, I mean, unless there's been more communication with him since then. Maybe you could forward that, re-forward that to Don. Okay. I will do that. Okay. Using your Yahoo address, Don. Right. Well, I'm not going to really resend it, but... Uh, this is just what, okay, all right. So he didn't really forward me messages. He just, anyway, but you have, you should have it in you your know, I I'm uncomfortable with that being there in that format, saying that it's the zoning map because it hasn't been voted as such. And, um, It is a good point, Judy. Um, does that really? The, the old map, what was there before had, had the mistakes on it, which was voted, but it didn't have the aquifer overlay district on it. Now, if he's corrected the mistakes and added the aquifer overlay district, it's probably correct, but it's not voted. And either way, I think it ought to come off till off the, property map until we, we get something voted, which would be after town meeting in June. So your recommendation is we ask town offices to take down any publicly posted digital zoning maps. Is that correct? As opposed um, to restoring I, an old one. Well, I would specifically ask them to take take it off the assessor's map layers because I think that's very misleading to any property owner or could be. I agree. In fact, that I, already, I already did talk to Brian about that with the old maps because, you know, not having the aquifer overlay zone on the, on your property parcel is, is pretty dangerous. Do we believe the assessor or anyone in town hall for that matter has a gold standard paper copy of the last zoning map that was voted on? Yeah, 
the the last one was voted on. Um, there are, uh, I won't say copies, but uh, yeah, there, there are copies of it, digital copies of it that were sent to Lynn uh, 10 months ago or so. Quite a, quite that, a That's the map that's on the planning board uh, page of, at waitley.org. That's not the map that was formerly in the layers on the assessor's maps. I've been asking this question because I thought it was my understanding that the online maps are not considered authoritative. They may be wrong and misleading. I mean, we shouldn't be putting bad information up digitally, but it was always considered advisory and that if it really, if a, if a citizen, a, a resident down had a, had a specific concern, they needed to go to town offices and consult paper map either at, in the clerk's office or with the assessor. So my that's, incorrect that's in understanding with, that. That's true with the floodplain bylaw. I don't think it's necessarily true of the others, although there ought to be a large paper map, but I don't think people would say, and, and the digital ones are for guidance generally. But I don't think it means you people shouldn't consult them. But that's, they don't, with the floodplain one, they don't even want the digital map, map to be shown anywhere. Who doesn't? The state. Floodplain information people. Peggy Sloan told us to take it off the, take it off our zoning map. Let's see. Once we vote the floodplain district, we're gonna have to, we won't be putting that on the zoning map. So let's see, right now on the Waitley Planning Board page. There is a zoning map that is asserted to be approved by the Attorney General on November 18th, 2021. So that's what the link says. Now, that's correct. That's correct. It, that part of it is correct. It was approved. Okay. But, it, but the map itself is not correct. Okay. So the A map, let me clarify this A map was approved by the Attorney General in November of 2021, but that approved map is not actually posted correctly on the link. It, what's at the other end of that link on our planning board page is wrong. Is that is that true? Is that a true statement, Judy? The map that is posted at the link on our planning board page is the one that was approved, but it is it contains errors. Okay, so it's a but, it's a legitimate. It's an approved map. We just don't like it because it's got errors that need to be corrected. The errors have been corrected. But well, not, not approved. We don't, no, we don't like it. I think it, to users, it could be misleading. And I think we have an obligation not to mislead the users. Yeah. It has, and, and Don has made corrections, but they have not been approved. Yeah. Right. So, so I not, guess what I'm asking is that I agree that it's, it's bad to have a posted map that's been approved, but approved with errors that need correction. But I'm also hearing we cannot post a corrected map that people can use until I'm, we go through the voting process. Yeah, I'm not saying we should take down the posted map on our page. I'm saying we should remove the layer from the assessor's maps because the mistakes there are much more grievous because it did, or at least did. Well, there are two problems. I don't know what's there now. What was there before did not include the aquifer overlay district. If Ryan is still having problems with that, it may still not be there. That's a huge mistake. The others okay. were a few parcels here and there. But, um, but those parcel mistakes were there before too. 
if in fact now that, that has been all been fixed on the assessor's maps, that's equally a problem because that's not approved. So I would like to see the, that layer come off the assessor's maps till, till something new is voted. So I'm actually hearing maybe two actions. One action is addresses the problem with a map that's posted. Right now, if a citizen clicked on our planning board, the link on our planning board page for the approved map, it would get a map that, that we know to have errors, but they would not know to have errors. That's, so was, that's the approved map. Um, we've been living with that. I think that's okay. The way we fix that is to get a revised map voted at town meeting. I agree with that. However, do we have an obligation to provide some kind of warning label to a somebody who views the posted map that basically says, this map is the only one that's been approved. We're aware of it, it has these errors. If you're concerned, you know, whatever. Or is it a fine to just leave a map up that we know have errors and it's gonna take us some time to get it corrected. And then there's a second action related to taking down the errors from the uh, ArcGIS map. So I'm asking really, I think there's consensus on the second part. Let's ask, and we have to ask the assessor. The assessor is the action officer for removing layers from the, um, the GIS map, is that correct? I talked to Cynthia about this about six weeks ago. She had no idea how those layers got up there. Okay. Um, but yes, Brian thinks that she's the action officer. <laughs> okay, so we asked the assessor to take an action that the assessor doesn't know how to I take. I think what you do is take, ask the assessor to talk to Ryan. Okay, all right. Because I feel comfortable, comfortable at, I using the planning board mailbox can convey that information to Cynthia. The second question is, is it fine for us to leave uh, a map with errors, albeit approved by the attorney general up without providing any other information to residents during this period while we're trying to get a corrected map approved and then posted? I think you need we need to make some kind of statement. I mean, now that we know that we've discussed it and it's on the record, I think we need to we, I think we need to deal with it and put some kind of notification that says uh, it's under construction, the errors are being corrected. Um, please don't use this as your final as the final word, something to that effect. Well, we, we know where the errors are. It might be easier to send a letter to the to the people in the parcels. Yes. Pine Plains, Miskowski Circle, and the Monahans. Hmm. What, what shouldn't that also be public what, knowledge, what, not just for those part, yeah. uh, parcel owners? I actually think it would be more straightforward to um, modify the website so that the link currently that goes to a PDF file goes to a page that it that contains some uh, information about known errors, and then that page links to the map containing those errors. And then it becomes public knowledge. So anyone who goes, clicks on the Waitley zoning map link on our page, gets to another page with some information, you know, brief bullets to, it's a couple of parcels are mislabeled, uh, these two subdivisions. And then we have the link that says, you can follow this link and get this map. And if you're not, if you're not living in an area affected by these errors, then the map is good enough. Well, I'll put it up if you'll draft it. I will. All right, happy to do that. I'm happy to work with the town clerk or the administrative assistant on getting the right, getting the right arrangement on the town website. So in the short term, this is how we're going to fix the problem with an erroneous PDF map posted. And then separately, we'll communicate with the assessor and request that the, and is it just the 
floodplain overlay. What is it that needs to be removed? The zoning layer. The zoning layer in its entirety. Okay. And and another reason is that it doesn't have a key, so so it's not very helpful anyway. The way it is has been. Maybe that's been fixed too. But yes, I think just to pull the zoning layer for a while till we get straightened out. Is there a consensus on that here? I'm in favor. Don? Um, the information that is up there is correct. And I would rather have information that's not approved, but is correct on the site than incorrect information. So the choice is... Is the um, aquifer overlay district there? I, I, no, it's not, but... Then it's not correct. And again, could we be clear what we're speaking about? There's the PDF map, and then there's the GIS map. This is the GIS map that Don is talking about, I believe. The, the, the rest, the, I'm basically talking about the zoning map and the zoning map is correct, except it does not have the overlay. But most people are not looking for the overlay, they're looking for the zoning. So the PDF that, that, zoning I'm map. I'm sorry, Don, that is a critical part of the zoning. There are whole kinds of things you can't do in that aquifer overlay district. That, that area. Let me, um, I'm going to share my screen <laughs> so we don't have to imagine this. This is the what is posted. This is the map that appears. No, he's talking about the, the assessor's maps. All right. Well, he said zoning map. So, well, it's the zoning he's, he's, he's talking about because the aqua, you have to pull up the assessor's map. Go to Waitley. Go to these, go to the home page and click on okay. assessors. All right. So Don, I just want to make sure when you said you want, you would prefer talking while I'm trying to share my screen at the same time. So this is the this is the zoning, the online GIS zoning. Map. Okay. On the upper left there, there's that layers tab. Uh, oh yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, there we are. Sorry. And here's the zoning map. Okay. Let's make that go away. So this is. So all that aquifer overlay area is not there. So for can, instance. Can I chime in as a uh, zoning map user? Yes. Yeah, sure. Um if I were researching a parcel, say doing a feasibility study or something, and came across this GIS map, um, I would not then go looking for the PDF. And if the aquifer overlay were not on here, um, maybe if I saw it in the bylaw, I might ask, hmm, where is the aquifer overlay? But I would assume that a parcel that's not shown with the overlay is not in it and, and would not consult that zoning and would potentially do quite a bit of work that would then be undone when discovering that the that the real map has that overlay. Um, I, I did notice that the layers aren't labeled, so I would probably stop there and then go looking for a different map. But uh, I would I would back Judy's point that if the overlay is part of zoning and it's not on the map, then then that would be a, a potentially uh, disastrous for for a project that we were going to start looking at. Okay. So that's a, a, a vote for temporarily removing all of these zoning layers from the GIS map until all the proper data is available and can be displayed. Okay. Yes, GIS map on Waitley.org. Okay. Yes. That's where I that's where I got that from. All right. So those are two actions. 
and we'll we'll still I, I hear Chris's point about the PDF map, but it still seems like one of the places people land, they come to the planning board page, they click on a link for the zoning map, and that's for some people just looking at a PDF document is a little bit more accessible uh, and user friendly than looking at a GIS map. So we should provide a warning in the inter interim that the PDF map has known errors that will be corrected uh, and we will eliminate the zoning layer from the GIS map temporarily until it can be rolled back out fully correct. We'll try to. We will try to, okay. All right, well, I thought that was gonna be a simple and fast discussion, but apparently not, but that was helpful. Okay, all right, I'll work on those two actions. And um, I will confer with Ryan and see what I can do to get him up to date. Great, all right. Okay, the next thing on the agenda is uh, discussion of potential zoning bylaw changes. Floodplain, battery storage, solar bylaw, and cannabis and social policy. And how do we want to add, when and how do we want to add this new item uh, from DMCTC relating to um, marijuana, limited marijuana manufacturing? Why don't we do it first while our guests are here? Let's say they've already had to sit through that zoning map one. Your, your guests would certainly appreciate that. <laughs> Excuse me, can can anyone or everyone hear Mary? Yes. yes. Okay, I just emailed everybody that I was told my mic wasn't working. Everything else seemed fine, but my internet connection has dropped twice since then, so I hope it hangs in there. Okay. All right, so Chris then, Chris and or Jared have the floor. Do, do they have screen sharing? They're gonna share a draft. Um, sure, let me put it up just a second ago. Yes, I can do that. Um, and so, you know, we're here informally. My understanding is Jared was here maybe last month um, to sort of broach this topic. Um, uh, and so the, um, the I, I guess actually you, you should tee it up and, and sort of uh, give the big picture and then I'll, I'll fill in the details. But essentially we, we're, we're here to talk about, you know, informally some potential text um, and then also procedurally um, just to, to clarify how this process works and, and sort of our position for advocating um, some of these changes. So, Jared, do you want to just give the, the high level where this is coming from? Sure. So I the last time um, we spoke, I was making a recommendation from the public about um, types of manufacturing uses that I, I was suggesting ought to be allowable in the commercial space. So what we tried to do was differentiate um, what we are calling light or limited uh, marijuana manufacturing from heavy or unlimited uh, marijuana manufacturing. And so there are specific types of activities um, that and materials that um, marijuana product manufacturers use um, that are flammable or more dangerous than others and require um, classified spaces and hazardous material uh, uh, approvals, credentials. And so the suggestion was that those ought not to be allowed in the commercial space, commercial zone, um, but that other things involving um, filling and capping of carts, um, you know, ice water baths uh, for hash production, um, rolling pre-roll joints and, and other kind of 
lighter activities ought to be allowable in the commercial zone um, because they don't pose the same kind of risks that these um, uh, classified spaces do. And so uh, Chris has done, I think, a nice job integrating that proposal uh, with proposed language for the uh, for the Whaley Town bylaws. Yeah, and so then sort of taking conceptually that idea, uh, Jared tasked me with with uh, starting to put together a draft of specifically um, how this could be addressed in the zoning bylaw. Um, and so that's what I sent ahead and have on our screen here. Um, and so I'll just sort of run through the details um, and then are, are happy to discuss um, uh, further. And I, I sort of approached this from um, a position of trying to be, you know, extra specific and perhaps a little extra wordy um, in trying to define exactly what it is that we're talking about. Um, and and generally to err on the side of being a little bit more restrictive where where there was some room um, in putting the language together. And so what we are proposing then would be a new is is essentially to leave the existing marijuana manufacturer use um, unchanged, that that would cover um, you know everything. Uh, that is uh, under the definition of, I'm actually going to pull out my, my set of the bylaws, which I forgot to pull out in front of me a second ago. It's really helpful to reference. Um, which then um, follows the definition in the marijuana um, section of the bylaw defining a marijuana manufacturer, which is primarily the activities that go along with the marijuana manufacturing license um, and also um, include uh, not just extraction uh, with different methods, uh, production of uh, infused food products, um, as well as packaging um, and, and, you know, essentially all of that middle space between uh, the cultivation and very basic drying processing and um, delivery to a retail use. So that would all continue to be encompassed under the general marijuana manufacturer, which is currently allowed by special permit in the commercial industrial and the industrial zones, um, but then would carve out a separate um, use, which we're calling marijuana manufacturer limited. Um, and you know, we toyed with limited versus light Given that the table of uses already has a category called light industrial, we opted for the word limited just to distinguish that and, and prevent any confusion. Um, but the idea that this is a subset of manufacturing activities which are less intensive um, and, and don't have uh, certain hazardous materials associated with them, which could then be, you know, of course done in industrial and commercial industrial, but then also in the general commercial zone. And so then um, that's the table of use um, edit. Uh, and then um, we created a definition of what that marijuana manufacturer limited would be. And this sort of focuses on that hazard component that Jared was just mentioning um, as sort of the, the most significant demarcation between the more intense and less intense activities. Um, and also being, you know, we feel a pretty clear way to draw that distinction, trying to limit the gray area that may be in the middle. Um, and so the, the language that, that uh, I put together, again, entirely a draft, is um, that the limited marijuana manufacturer is an entity meeting the definition of general manufacturer, but limited to specific operational processes that do not require the use of materials or chemicals identified as hazardous or flammable uh, by any state or local authority. So um, again, they, they already have to be, you know, sort of in that manufacturer space licensed by the CCC as a manufacturer um, and, uh, and part of that definition that says they're taking the agricultural product, they are uh, doing some sort of process to it 
and then transmitting it to a retailer, uh, but then excluding any uses that require materials that are again hazardous or flammable. Um, and and just as as a black and white definition, you know, if that material is listed by some government entity as either hazardous or flammable, uh, you know, that that was sort of the 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 intention for that definition. And then to add, a, you know, a little bit of commentary almost to to again clarify the intent of that definition, uh, we are suggesting marijuana. Product manufacturer limited includes the following activities if they meet that definition of not requiring those hazardous materials. And that would potentially include production of marijuana infused food products, um, extraction of uh, the oils using ice water or other non hazardous, non flammable materials, filling and capping products with the concentrate. Physical production, meaning uh, rolling or infusing products without the use of chemical processes. So really just sort of uh, combining and recombining different products that are already stable. Packaging of finished products, you know, very simply just the, the physical um, packaging and boxing and, and bagging of things. And then warehouse and distribution of those finished products, uh, presumably to a retailer. Um, and then uh, uh, adding a couple of other, you know, clear demarcations that in all cases, the limited manufacturer does not include um, uh, uh, any process that requires the use of storage of propane, butane, ethanol, carbon dioxide in the manufacturing process, um, with the exception that uses that are consistent with general building operations like propane heating or cooking appliances uh, would not be excluded there. Um, so the, really the goal is to get at the input um, into this marijuana specific process is hazardous sort of uh, at its base. Um, and then uh, we would exclude any activity that creates a class one hazardous location. And that comes from the National Electric Code. And this is where uh, things like uh, what some people know as C1D1 and C1D2 spaces um, are defined. Um, and so again, this is just sort of to create a black and white situation. The This section of the electric code um, focuses on any processes that use flammable uh, liquids or gases in such a way that they can create concentrations in the air that become ignitable. And then under the electric code, that creates the requirement to create a space with specific uh, facilities to prevent accidental ignition. Um, and so that that is sort of a clear code-based um, uh, uh, code based definition um, that could be triggered and and is just very easy to exclude um, any of those activities. Um, and then um, we would also uh, clarify the section about setbacks uh, because currently the uh, zoning bylaw creates a 50 foot setback from all property lines except for retailers in the commercial district. Um, so in order to be consistent with that, um, uh, that restriction, uh, we would suggest changing that to marijuana retailers and limited manufacturers in the commercial district would be subject to the reduced 20 foot setback from property lines instead of the 50 foot setback that applies to all other marijuana uses in all other zones. Um, and then we would suggest adding a section to the list of uh, the, the site standards, the, the 21 current items to add an additional uh, requirement to submit information for those limited manu marijuana manufacturers to submit a complete list of the proposed activities and any chem chemicals and materials in those activities so that the board could review um, and be assured that, uh, that everything going on in this proposed use is consistent with the definition. Or alternatively, a, a way to address that would be to submit a statement signed by an officer stating that none of those things are going to be done. It's sort of either tell us what you're doing or go on record that you're not doing any of those bad things. It could have been, it could be either way to address that. Um, 
And then just uh, housekeeping to if that section got inserted in that list of 21 site requirements to then renumber uh, the sections. Um, so again, first draft, there are probably some improvements, some better language to be used in some of these things, um, but that uh, just sort of in, in more concrete terms um, is what uh, Jared is suggesting um, as a change to allow these limited activities in the commercial zone. I wish you'd been around to help with bylaw revisions before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Great work. Great, on, very on thorough job. Yeah. Thanks. And I, I've spent a lot of time using this bylaw, so I'm very familiar with how it's put together. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess I have a couple of you know, things in the range of comments, questions, and feedback. Yeah. So I guess conceptually, you're you want to make the argument that this new subclass of mar marijuana manufacturers or marijuana product manufacturers as it's formally called in the bylaw, that this subclass behaves much more like uh, the kinds of commercial uses, the other commercial uses that we permit within the commercial zone by special permit. So is that a fair statement? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a good restatement in my um, opinion. Okay. Um, and it seems like there's this, like when the by, when the line in the table of use for regular, you know, full undifferentiated marijuana product manufacturers was put in, and at the time, uh, Waitley uh, opted to disallow full regular marijuana manufacturing in the commercial zone. Seems like you're also suggesting that the main driver at that time of the aversion in the town to allowing manu ma marijuana manufacturing in commercial districts was primarily, if not exclusively, driven by concerns about, um, you know, sort of operations and use of hazardous materials and so forth. Since that seemed to be what you're primarily trying to address in different, you know, that these, this more limited kind of a marijuana product manufacturer is not doing the kinds of things that that regular marijuana manufacturers could be doing, which then might reasonably give people who might reside within our commercial zones. Remember in Waitley, we have residences share sort of cohabiting our commercial districts in many areas. Um, so there's reasonable concern about regular manufacturing processes in, in commercial zones. You feel this is a this is the main driver of the difference. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, and, and I think that the marijuana manufacturing, let's let's say, look at it from, from the state licensing perspective, there is marijuana manufacturer, which, uh, which turns out to be a fairly wide umbrella that includes activities that are truly industrial activities Right. Um, that that you know are not dissimilar to what you might see happening in the Yankee Candle Factory uh, in terms of the intensity of that that activity, and then there are other activities that are much more in line with what uh, I think uh, the the typical person would regard as as commercial. And you know, I, I think about I was just looking through the table of uses, and you know, there aren't uh, many. Uh, I don't see anything that jumps out at me as food production, but I think that um, if you look at, say, you know, the taking the extracted concentrate and in a small commercial kitchen, producing packaged food items is is similar to what a chocolate shop might do or, or mm. something like that, where, you know, there may be a little bit of cooking, but it's not uh, necessarily this uh, large factory type process. Um, and 
and uh, I'd actually be curious where where the town might might see that sort of activity going on. Um, but then, you know, to to really go go to the sort of lowest impact activity, you know, one of the methods that DMCTC um, is planning to do at the Three River Road establishment, at least, is literally putting plant material in a barrel of ice water and stirring it for a while and then filtering it out, which is a, a long distance from from what we what what you think of of an industrial manufacturing use, and so I think. You know, admittedly, the the hazardous material demarcation is a little bit of a post facto justification, but we were trying to, but we don't want to try to suggest language that's going to have a lot of gray area to it, um, because that that could be fraught with difficulty on your part as applicants come by in the future, and also confusing to people who want to start businesses in town as to what's in and what's out. Um, and so we focused on that as sort of reasonable demarcation between the commercial and the industrial, um, it, sort of um, at, at, a, at a, a lay person review level of, yeah, I, I think it makes sense that non-hazardous activities uh, are commercial. And, but if, you're, if you need to create a special space um, in order to house your pressurized butane to, to remove this stuff, well, that, that should be with the factories. Um, and, and so I think we, we hit on that as a pretty clear line that could be drawn that would generally separate the, the higher intensity and you know, to some the more noxious um, activities from the one that are less. And again, we're not, we're not talking about uh, the, the limited manufacturing happening anywhere. It's specifically in the commercial zone. Uh, which is already set up to have business uses and and some level of intensity, um, but at a different level than than your typical industrial uses. If that helps. I'm just piggybacking on that, Chris. I guess I think about our um, our bubble hash, our ice water hash production, sort of similar to the tea guys, and gummy production similar to muffins. I guess that was conceptually where I was coming from, mm -hmm. is that there's already commercial activity that seems no more, you know, no more noxious than than what we intend to do. I have one other question before I want to let other people weigh in, and that is, so there's this other underlying issue of trust in the community. And I guess I want to ask the following question. Um, how hard or easy, if, if one established one of these limited manufacturing facilities in a particular you know, building footprint, um, how, and, and then one decided like, oh, you know, I'm not uh, getting as much out of this limited manufacturing as if I, went more full scale. Now I've, got, I've established a foothold, I've built a building, now I'm doing manufacturing. No one can see in, in my building from the outside. Now I'm converting it from limited to you know, less than limited. Nice. Um, and I guess my question is like, how hard or easy would that be to do? Like, There's this trust issue that I wonder if we might face. Just I would say, think. yeah. I mean, so from, I guess, my perspective, it, if you're going to be doing something with pressurized gas, you would need to, and if you're going to do it right, you would need to get permission from the state fire marshal, as we have, and you would be taking receipt um, quite often of these pressurized gas containers. You'd have people showing up, you know, consistently with pressurized gas containers. It would be really pretty easy to identify and you wouldn't just be messing. Excuse me. So you, you, I think what you're saying is that there would be enough observables and, uh, and recurring observables that zoning violations would be detectable. I mean, putting aside oh. all the challenges we seem to have in this community with enforcement. And it would be, it would be not just um, tussling with the Waitley zoning bylaws, you would be messing with state fire marshal. I mean, 
real, real safety uh, stuff that, you know, larger, you know, um, authorities having jurisdiction would care very much about. And you know, I think that goes to the inclusion of this hazardous location definition, because that's a clear black and white part of the electric code, which then um, is, you know, that sort of thing is taken very seriously by electrical inspectors, by building inspectors, and by the state fire marshal. Um, so I think that we can very confidently answer that question in terms of anything that would that would create that would require one of these hazardous locations. There are a number of codes with with I imagine pretty severe penalties that would be violated um, for someone to uh, be you know doing uh, let's say midnight work there. Um, I think the the question is sort of that that in between space, and I, I say this is a question I'm actually ignorant of, so I'm I'm going to tee Jared up to address it. Is that are there manufacturing processes that would not trigger this hazardous location under the building code that? would also not meet our proposed definition of limited, meaning that there's some sort of hazardous or flammable material, but it's not used in such a way that that C1D1 space is actually required. Because that's where, if I were trying to game the system, that's that's sort of more likely than, right. than to bring in a butane extraction that you know now you're really doing a serious violation at that point. So for that, I, I guess my feeling is it's not C1D1, it's any classified space. So C1D1 is the highest level of classification, but there's also C1D2. And so I guess what we're suggesting is that any classified space, whether it's ethanol or butane or propane or pentane or any of these things, um, any classified space would be out. Uh, so not just the C1D1. I'm not sure if that was addressing your but you're, yeah, and, you're and I, I think this that, that there may be a little better language here, but um, and I was educating myself on this. So, so the way this section of the code is written is there are class one, class two, and class three hazardous locations. A class one hazardous location is then divided into class one, division one, C one D one, and C one D two. C1D1 is you're doing something that creates a situation where it's likely that you could have concentrations in the air of ignitable fumes. And then C1D2, division two, is you have a process that could create those fumes, but there are active measures, uh, ventilation or other such measures to control it. But if those failed, you'd have ignitable fumes in the air. And so those are two different levels. Um, and then class two and three uh, involve dust and fibers that are that that are potentially combustible in the air, which, I mean, we could just say, say blanket hazardous location. At the last minute, I changed to class one, which is the, the flammable fumes, um, just to, to be a little bit more precise. Um, but uh, I guess the question is, regardless of that distinction, C1D1 or C1D2, but a, is, is, are there processes that involve hazardous or flammable materials as an input that don't require classified space at all, that, that someone could theoretically just start doing as a violation of zoning without triggering some of these other codes? Not to my knowledge. I mean, not, not something that uh, yeah, I mean, I, what we're really seeking to regulate is the ethanol, propane, butane, things that require that classification um, and that you, you would need to bring in inspectors um, to, to certify third party um, inspection that certifies that you've had it installed correctly, that all of your safety measures you know, have redundancy and are operational, um, you know, and, and that's exactly what we've gone through at our at our Three River Road site. And so we're suggesting that that 
remain in the industrial site um, and not be allowed in commercial sites. And then I guess, you know, as I'm trying to pick apart my own statements, just as, as we as we sort of chase this out, um, is size a, a factor here that even if you're doing sort of these limited activities, if they get to a certain size is the impact of that where now you have a factory. And I, I don't necessarily, I don't know that it necessarily is or not, but I'm, I'm throwing it out as a question as I'm trying to think about if I had a different client who wanted to game this and was asking for my advice, um, what might they do? Um, I mean, uh, so, I, so footprint I of the a large operation. kitchen, a large kitchen may be something like that, but kitchens are allowable in the, in the commercial zone anyway. And a gummy kitchen, for instance, isn't dissimilar from any other food preparation kitchen. Um, so I, I don't think there's anything inherent to the cannabis aspect of it that differentiates a gummy kitchen, say, from a non-medicated gummy kitchen. Other, what what are other reactions to this? Right. I have a couple questions. Um, one is I'm curious how you folks would regard the the risk of this limited marijuana manufacturer compared to that of a marijuana testing operation um i would say about the same uh, but marijuana testing operations are are not allowed in the commercial district and i guess i would be curious about the reasoning for why that was decided if it was about the the intensity of the activity or about the input materials that are used there, uh, I'm I'm not familiar with what logic was used to arrive at that decision, but it may it may this conversation may suggest that that too could be in a commercial activity, that that you know that's more akin to a biotech, you know like a a clean room space with. Um, um, forgetting what the what the acronym stands for, but the piece of equipment is an HPLC. Um, it's liquid chromatography, um, but it's it's not it's not particularly hazardous in any way. I think the logic was primarily to keep commercial to to distinguish. Well, let's phrase it the other way: to keep commercial uh, businesses in the commercial district and to allow space for them while putting manufacturing and, and, and biotesting kinds of things in, in more industrial zones. Um, so I guess, you know, one thing that I would, I would point to in responding to that is I'm, I'm looking at the table of uses right now and the following uses are currently allowed by special permit and commercial. Um, and I'm on page 10 of the zoning bylaw, uh, if anybody wants to follow along. But we've got uh, warehouses, wholesale trade and distribution, bulk storage, storage of material, merchandise and products or equipment, um, provided that the use is enclosed within a building and not hazardous. Um, uh, enclosed assembly, bottling, packaging, or finishing plants of non-hazardous materials. Um, other light industrial uses not involving the use of hazardous materials as a principal activity, provided that the use will not be offensive, injurious, noxious, or hazardous. Um, so right there, I would say those are sort of three, um, three general uses that are currently allowed in commercial that are pretty consistent with uh, exactly what we're talking about that are allowed in the commercial zone. I understand. Those all preceded my time on uh, understood. Yeah. <laughs> I know they're there. I wish they weren't, but they are. Okay. The other the other question I have is where we do have prohibitions against hazardous materials, they have been defined in terms of the DERs uh, 
prohibit of what do you call it hazardous waste regulations rather than the ones you cited and I wondered why you picked yours as opposed to that. I wasn't sure what standard to cite and so as a draft to begin discussion purposes um, that's where I started is the honest answer. Okay. Um, I know that those were generally done in response to the well pollution and a lot of the focus there was on, on contamination. But certainly that includes flammability and, and other risks as well. And I don't know enough to comment which is best. Tom, you're the expert. Sorry. I I just I'm I noticed that the pre, the other hazardous material regulations quote the DER's regulations, which go on forever, having looked at them, um, and and these these are in the National Electric Code. I. I don't know if your work on this gives you any idea which makes more sense. Um, is that a, maybe is that a no, Tom? Is that addressed to me, Tom? Yeah. yeah. Would, you, would you restate that please, Judy? Well, if I look at the the non-residential use section, which is where where the prohibitions against use of hazardous materials generally are most strictly outlined, it it cites compliance with uh, DER regulations and specifically three ten CMR thirty. Um, whereas these are using the the ones that they've cited, uh, the C one D one. Yeah, I guess I would and also I, add I um, that the the C one D one and C one D two space are commonly required in most uh, in in any of the general marijuana manufacturing facilities that that use any of that. So that got included specifically because. Um, marijuana manufacturing that is using those hazardous materials uh, typically does require those um, spaces. So I, I, I circled in on that as something especially applicable here. Um, so I think um, it would certainly be reasonable if, if the question is, uh, you know, set, setting aside whether the board agrees that this should be a commercial use, if we're talking about how to restrict hazardous material with the appropriate language, I think um, deferring to that same standard in the um, other sections is appropriate, but that I think additionally adding this language about the C1D1 and C1D2 space would probably be helpful specific to marijuana uh, because it's such a present uh, component of that industry that I, even just from a user guidance standpoint, um, when you see that as being not allowed, well, that, that immediately eliminates a number of processes that would normally be um, considered under marijuana manufacture. The, the question I've got for this is that uh, normally packaged marijuana products um, have um, content, concentrate, and, and things like that uh, that define how what the quality is of the uh, THC or CDC. And I'm wondering if that is something that, that you would would be included in what you would be doing when you're doing this manufacturing. 
Um, I mean, like say? setting limits on that, Don, or I'm... No, no for, for doing testing to find out the, 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 the potency of, of the, uh, the product. Oh, I see. Oh, would there be testing occurring in this facility to to determine that? Similar to a third party testing lab. Yes. Got it. Um, I, I mean, I can only speak for for us. That is not our intent. Um, but I, I don't. You know, to to Judy's point, I don't really see that as as um, as too dissimilar from some of these activities. I mean, so, you know, what, what Chris was talking about earlier with bubble hash production, you know, that's, I, I suppose even within this limited uh, manufacturing de definition, there are, there's still a continuum of, of use. So, you know, with hash production or pre-roll joint rolling at the absolute lowest end, and perhaps, you know, an HPLC, you know, liquid chromatography at the, maybe at the higher end within this. Um, yeah, um, I, I hadn't considered that and I'm, I'm happy to go and find out more about the kinds of spaces and um, chemicals used in, in HPLC. But my understanding is that labs are, are really not, uh, not hazardous environments. Right, for what I'm looking for is, is in your labeling of these products, um, it would seem that you would need to do some testing to find out. Oh yes, yes, we, we must, uh, we're required to send it out to a third party um, testing facility. Um, and so um, it has to be owned by a separate entity. It has to be at a, at a different location. Um, you know, that's part of what's being proposed in Deerfield is on the same site as the um, the proposed retail store cultivation facility uh, in Deerfield, just just north of us on on five and ten. Um, they're proposing to put a a testing facility there as well, um, and so we we would not you know we can't do our own we can't be our own referee. We have to send it out to a a separate third party testing facility. So you would just before you start working on a batch of whatever you're going to do, send it out and then use those figures to label your product. Exactly, exactly. So we, we, we produce it. Um, so for instance, if it's, <coughs> if it's bubble hash, um, we would, you know, do the wash. We would use the micron filters and, and uh, we would get the hash coming out. And we would um, gram it up, put it into, you know, one gram dram jars, and then send that out to a third party testing lab that would give us all the figures on the level of THC and terpenes, minor cannabinoids that would um, assure the public that there's no um, microbes or that the microbial limits are met, that there's no heavy metals, that there's no pesticides involved. And so all of that work would be done elsewhere by another third party. It, you know, we, we, we couldn't do it ourselves and have that be good enough for the state and for, for labeling. Okay, thank you, good answer. I think this is probably a good idea. It's a pretty uh, openly uh, spot zoning, but uh, I don't see a problem with that because it could be a, could be done any other place in town which would meet the same. I tend to agree with Don on that. I um. I'm sort of setting aside the, the, the point raised about the independent te testing laboratory. Feels to me like we are on the verge of having a very clear and tight definition of this new subclass of, of a marijuana product manufacturer. And then what we are effectively doing is um, providing discretion to the zone, uh, Zoning Board of Appeals 
by making it um, admissible under a special permit in the commercial zone. At present, uh, because the current table of use from our marijuana manufacturer says it is not per permitted at all in the commercial zone, effectively ZBA would not have discretion in the sense that they would then have to issue a variance if somebody, which they rarely do, right? So I understand there are sensitivities which I don't fully understand myself uh, among residents in the commercial district who may or may not feel comfortable with the idea of having a limited marijuana manufacturing operation per your definition, you know, next door. Um, however, it feels to me appropriate that we make it possible for that case to be presented and debated publicly in front of the Zoning Board of Appeals when they are within their right to deny a special permit to any particular applicant proposing such a limited manufacturing operation in a commercial district. Um, so yeah, I think I feel comfortable with the move. I can't say that it'll get approved at town meeting. Um, I don't, should we, is this maybe as a question for Don of process, is this the kind of thing where we as a board should sort of do a straw poll to give feedback or just generally give feedback to DMCTC of whether to proceed with this? And that's point one. And point two is the timing of this. Because like what would we we would need to provide more feedback about what would need to be done when for this to be taken up at a future annual or special town meeting. When, when would we do a public hearing? Well, so if, if we believe, let me articulate what I believe to be the case, or subject to correction, that we, the planning board, would need to have a public meeting, not a public hearing, to first discuss near final language of this. This, tonight's public, meeting wouldn't necessarily suffice. So we're, we have another, another public meeting at which we would schedule a public hearing if we're satisfied at that point. And we have to have any number of public meetings until we're ready to schedule a public hearing. Then we have the public hearing and you know whether we could get that all done by this coming annual town meeting is an open question. And then there's a strategy of how many of these we want to bring forward at annual town meeting. What do we, when is our annual town meeting this year? Has it been moved more closer? It's scheduled, to for, scheduled for June, I believe. It is can in go June. Back, can we go back to the process? Please. Um, first, I think the one thing is a bylaw change has to be has to go with or without the recommendation of the planning board to the select board. It, it's a requirement in state law. Um, typically, without the recommendation of the planning board, I think it might have to be by citizen petition. And I don't know. The last time we dealt with this, it was just that the citizen requested, went to the select board and requested it. Um, if I look at the, the state regulations, it, it looks to me like they require a petition of 10 registered voters. Um, and I'm, but anyway, assume that it, it would work like the solar petition we have. So the applicants, if, if we, if we did not want to go forward with it, the applicants would have the option of taking it, I believe, to the select board. Um, we might check that with Brian. I, I would think that if we're in favor, this language is probably close enough that we could take to a 
to a public hearing, but I'm not sure. I, I doubt that they, Chris did a very good job. I should point out that I personally am not in favor of going forward with this. I, we have such limited commercial space in town. I understand that there are a lot of light industrial uses that are permitted there. Um, our commercial space is on well-traveled roads with access for customers. Um, it's, whereas an operation like this could, does not need that kind of access. And I'm, I'm uncomfortable adding more uses of this type to the commercial space. It's, it's nothing against the use itself. And I think the analysis is correct that it, in terms of risk, it's, it's a fair use there. But I think it's become quite clear that we're gonna have difficulty adding more commercial space. And I, what we have, I would like to see preserved for things that actually allow for consumer access. But anyway, back to back to the process. So I would start with a, with a vote tonight about what we think, and then a discussion about how much more we think. If the, if that vote passes, then how much more time we think we want to spend on the draft. But we'll probably be. I think we wouldn't need a public hearing before April. Okay. If well. Maybe the beginning of, yeah, April, April, I would think. If in fact the meeting is scheduled, still scheduled for June, that we might need to clarify that. Right now we're looking at making changes to um, the floodplain bylaw, storage facilities for batteries, solar bylaw revisions and cannabis and social clubs. So that would be, if we added this one, that would be five different, Bylaws that we would. I'm not sure the floodplain bylaw is going to make it, but it might. Okay. And, and some of those others may not make it either. Yeah. Um, so maybe I'll make a motion that we vote to proceed with further development of this just thinking as I'm talking. So I'm making a motion that we approve uh, continued development of this um, bylaw revision to be discussed at our next regularly scheduled meeting. I'll just make the motion, then we can have a discussion about the motion before we vote on the motion. I can explain my thinking. Would it make more sense to vote on whether we approve the concept of adding the? Well, that's kind of what I'm trying to get at. Like, um, so maybe if maybe I would just take that as a we we we're going to vote on whether to approve the concept of revising the bylaw in this way. So is that your motion at this point? That's my motion. Do you have a second? A second that. Okay, the motion's been made and seconded. So I'll just explain that I think the what we're doing with this vote is providing feedback to the to DMCTC as to whether we want to see this um, further developed and potentially taken to a public hearing. Brent, how, how this is a quite a technical um, set of guidelines. How, how do we how do we how do we come up with the expertise to to check that this is all straightened on the up and up? And this being that um, the chemicals involved, the processes involved, um, a, a, th a third party check on it. 
I don't feel qualified to, to yeah. look at some of the, the chemical aspects of this. But should those be checked before it goes out and much further? So we, we have somebody to advise us on um, this the, 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 the proposal. Yeah, well, I guess I feel, I think that's a very good question. I don't know the answer off the top of my head. Um, merely voting to, I mean, we can either vote to just say, let's just cut, cut this off now and not pursue this. That's a valid vote, just end, end it now. Um, voting to let it continue means that we will have more time to discuss and uh, get those questions addressed. And ultimately in a public hearing, these questions can be raised. If we get to an eventual public hearing, they can be raised. They can be answered either satisfactorily or not. And then at the end of a public hearing, we as a board vote whether or not to recommend whatever that bylaw revision is at that point. So there are multiple points in the future where this could um, either stop or continue. And right now, I think we're just trying to make a decision as to whether we cut this off early. Well, one of the things that all of these bullet points have except warehousing uh, is things that many home users and people that, that grow their own marijuana um, are doing in their kitchens. I would, wouldn't you say that's pretty accurate, Jared? Yeah, so absolutely. Yeah. So I, I don't see a real problem with any of the of any of the things that are being proposed to be allowed to do. Um, now the question is more whether the things that are banned are adequate. Right. In favor of moving it forward, just from my own, my own perspective, I'm in favor of moving it forward. What, what does moving it forward mean in terms of um, tightening this up to, in a form that we're comfortable with it going to a public hearing and getting feedback? And just turning turning back to the applicants and saying, well, that's, they, they, they drafted this. Either they represent it themselves or if we're going to represent it, I'm going to take it forward. I think we need to have it be comfortable with it that we're, we're voting on something that we know what we're talking about. Well, Chris, is it, it, it appears to me that the things that you can't do, in all cases, blah, 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 uh, pretty much covers anything that could be considered hazardous. Is that what your intent is? That's the intent, um, you know, based on the conversation we've had, I think we would certainly add in um, whatever language you're using that restricts um, hazardous materials in other uses in town. I think that's a, a good change. Um, we would wanna keep the, the ban on uh, activities requiring a hazardous location. Um, and, um, yeah, I think I think uh, again, any any activity requiring the input of a hazardous or flammable material uh, is is really in in the base definition. Um, it that we're talking about manufacturing processes that do not use any of these materials. So that 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 again was was the the clearest line that we could draw between the two types of of manufacturing was. Um, is is a hazardous or flammable material integral to this process or not? Well, we've got uh, chemicals identified as hazardous or flammable. Now, as I heard, it's, you're not going to be using any chemicals at all. You're going to be using ice water and kitchen tools, basically. Well, ice water is a chemical. So I, I want to be careful with, with language there. Um, I, so I was very careful to not use the word chemical loosely. If passed, this bylaw would apply to anybody wanting to do this, not just these guys. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Well, that's, I'm getting back to, Brent had two questions earlier on, and one was true, what was the public trust? 
again, I think this is what we were looking at here is really very well done, very well thought out, but we can't count on th this one applicant always coming back. There may be other applicants who want to pursue this also. And at the end of the day, it comes down to a matter of enforcement. That's another conversation for a different day. But um, is it, is it are we, do we have the basic ability to enforce this? So That's I guess a another piece, Tom, that I, I kind of see the big issue here is really around what is there in the row under commercial. Right now, we have one notion of mar marijuana, marijuana manufacturer, and we, based on whatever our intuitions or understandings at that time, whenever we did that, we said, well, whatever, whatever a marijuana manufacturer does, we definitely don't want that in a commercial district. Full stop, no. So that no was in there. Really what we're talking about here is creating a definition where we change that no in the commercial zone to special permit, meaning that we now give the Zoning Board of Appeals the opportunity to make their reach their own evaluation given a particular application, whether that's from DMCTC or another, they can do this evaluation based on the location of the parcel, the information provided to the ZBA at the time of the special permit application. And I feel like I have enough faith and trust in the Zoning Board of Appeals to make a good decision at that time, rather than saying, no, 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 we under no circumstances do we want any kind of manufacturing, limited or not, in the commercial district. I agree with that. And that ultimately comes down to the to voters. That's right, too. That even if this comes, passes a public hearing and we vote to recommend it, uh, and we this is discussed at town meeting, other, you know, there may be enough voters who are uncomfortable for the reasons Judy or uh, Articulate or any others, and they'll be like, nope, we don't want that in a commercial district. So it's got to be no, and it would fail at a town meeting. I'd like to see this go that far and, and ultimately take it in front of voters. So we have a motion on the floor. Is there any, any further discussion? Um, I just wanted to add one thing on the on the timeline. Currently on the town calendar, May 23rd has a, a an item annual town meeting time TBD. Whether that affects the, the timeline. Okay. That affects a lot of things in this meeting. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Okay. I mean, maybe there's that. Well, so maybe we should do. I think we should just call the question and have the vote, and then there's the question of timing. Okay. Uh, take a false vote. Uh, false voice vote. Don, aye. Tom, aye. Grant, aye. Judy, no. And uh, Sarah. You're muted, Sarah. Sorry, no. Okay, it's three to two, the majority carries. So now we have the question of timing and I haven't done the calendar math to know what- Well, we don't have to continue just holding meetings once a month. Um, I think if you're- I think we could hold a, the warrant for the town meeting has to be out two weeks, has to be posted two weeks before the meeting. It needs at least, it probably needs two weeks to get through town council or a week and a half or something before. So town council has to review it, the select board has to sign it. So you're backed into, 
late April. So we would need to get our act together to get this approved, get any of our bylaw changes approved, have yeah. a public hearing. Um, I want to be clear on what we just voted on. We, we, I, my understanding is what we voted on was to move this forward for further discussion. Yeah. Um, yep. Without, um, to just as opposed to killing it here and now. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's true. We're just trying to figure out how fast that discussion so, has to so, move. Well, that's, that's, that's the point of what I'm saying. Um, what we didn't vote for is a, a tight time schedule to get this to town meeting. I think we're, yeah. Putting, getting ahead of ourselves, because yeah. um, I could see the subsequent conversations changing the outcome. I agree with Tom on that because, um, so I wanna hear from DMCTC, like, uh, are your plans such that you feel that this um, needs to be dealt with essentially this year, or just to be transparent, um, while we can do special town meetings, um, I think something like this would not be appropriate to do in a special town meeting where relatively few people attend. So we get like one, one, typically one shot per year. And where this is happening a little late, that's what you're starting to hear. We have a lot of other things we've been thinking about on the planning board that we know we're going to have to, we think we're going to have to bring before town meeting. Um, and while we want to be accommodating, sorry, Bray, um, we, yeah. So I just want your feedback, like how urgent is this for you? Just not that that plays a huge role in our decision-making. Um, I mean, it's a significant, I mean, it would be a significant um, change for us. Um, it would, would allow us to pretty significantly expand our operations in town. In facilities you already own. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, as an alternative, yeah. Okay. Well, I think we need to, personally, I think we ought to, we have to table this while we talk about some of the other things, we have to have a holistic view of what we're gonna do and try to get done for town meeting and then decide whether this might even fit. Okay, well, let's uh, move on to- One thing, I, I think we could ask that DMCTC perhaps be thinking about an, an independent uh, resource that we could consult for our next discussion. That's an excellent recommendation. Or perhaps to even recommend it to us before the next meeting. Be happy to do that. And, and I, I think we also- better, Jared. <laughs> and, I, and I think we also want them to work on the assumption that we will take this up, take, a, take another, look at this at our next regularly scheduled meeting. And if we decide to move up our schedule and have an ad hoc meeting in March, we'll let them know. But that normally the last Wednesday of March would be the next chance for us to talk about a revised version of this bylaw, of this proposed bylaw provision. Okay. I'm happy with that. Okay, so continuing uh, discussion of potential bylaw changes, um, floodplain bylaw would be next. I'll start with that. Um, Grant and I met with two people from the state. DE, DCR, DCR, I guess, um, who are the people that influence the, they're the intermediary for the National Flood Insurance Program. 
and they were it was a routine uh, checkup on on our implementation of the insurance program. And I missed much of the meeting, but the part that developed that related to the bylaw, they made it clear that the new FEMA maps would not for this area would not be out until the end of 2025 at the earliest. But it didn't sound too optimistic about that. Um, it also became clear that this time pressure that has um, You know, there was a time where if we didn't get this done by the end of 2019, the world would come to an end and, and it, the deadline keeps rolling and it would appear that the deadline is, is still extending out, but they, there's great, they would very much like to get it in place as soon as possible. And I think for the, for the possible jeopardy to any FEMA, FEMA awards that might be needed ever, um, we, should, we should try to do that. The people at that meeting were Scott Jackson and Brian and the two, two NFIP people, Grant and me. Did I, did I leave anybody out, Grant? I don't believe you did. I don't think so. Um, there was a lot of talk about the same problems, exemptions. Um, the state people don't seem to understand that. Um, what With did come out? And I think, it was the agricultural piece, right? Yeah, agriculture exemption. Um, they, those affect wetlands and floodplains independently of this bylaw, and and Scott has a a ruling from someone and I haven't seen it saying that he has no, no influence against, he, he cannot enforce floodplain regulations on agricultural property. And so we kind of going around there. Um, Brian said he came away with the sense that it was more important to get this in place quickly than to be worried about precise enforcement in terms of these state people. And I, I think that was a fair assessment. We agreed to meet and talk again, those of us who were on the, on the call. Um, I've asked Amy Lavalley to schedule that phone call. Uh, it hasn't happened yet. Um, People have been sick and on vacation, so she hasn't done that. My guess is I thought we could be ready for June. I don't think there's a prayer of getting that in place for May, for May town meeting. Um, the state geologist um, was involved in redoing some of the zone, uh, the uh, flood zone maps in Massachusetts, and I could check with them to see what kind of changes they actually found. I and think that, that might be helpful to us to in in crafting the bylaw. I think okay. um, more accurate. We are required to just what the template. Uh, please do that. Um, the template requires that you just insert the date of the FEMA map, which in our case is 1979. Right. And, um, and then when they issue a new one, then you just insert the date of the new map. And that's, that's the binding document. So, so we're bound, so the bylaw would be affected by that no matter what changes they've found since. But it would be helpful, obviously, to know that. Um, the other thing um, I asked Peggy Sloan, or one thing Scott Jackson asked at that meeting, was whether any other towns around here had had implemented the bylaw. And he was particularly interested in what enabling regulations they might have done. I 
contacted Peggy Sloan and she said that Conway had, Conway did pass one, they passed it last July. One of the issues in this, it, if you remember, it calls for a floodplain administrator, somebody who's gonna be in charge and get all of the permit clearances and report back to the NFIP. Um, it was gonna be Hannah or the community development person here. Um, town council felt that, that it had to be a staff person. Anyway, uh, it turns out that in Conway, that's the town administrator. And I think therefore that we will probably wind up making it the town administrator as well. And that clarifies one of the problems we had. Um, and I'm thinking that if there are places where there are exemptions, there are places where there are exemptions. Uh, the NFIP ch people program chose to use a bylaw as a way of, a zoning bylaw as a way to influence this. If state law pre puts problems in the way of that, well, we enacted the bylaw, that's the best we can do, but that's, we haven't discussed that, but that's, that's kind of where I'm coming at. But there's a lot of piecing together who's going to be doing what and who's educating whom about what and that kind of thing. Still. So, do you recommend that we simply table this till some future date or continue right to like, should we be? So, I, well, I you think we're not going to target town meeting. At this point, I think we need Scott Jackson and Ryan's input, which it's, 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 it's not, it's, it's, it's a problem bigger than us at this point. So yeah, I think we have to wait for this meeting of these people. That isn't scheduled yet, Judy? No, it hasn't. <laughs> and I invite all, all you to sit in when we do schedule it. I, I got a, email today from Natalie Madden, who was the other person from the state who sat in on this offer to help and asking where we're going. And I meant to send that to Brian and Amy because I'm not quite sure what, what happened to the scheduling of it. Okay, battery storage facilities. Um, have, we, have we done any, has there been any research done on that at all? I think what I, I, I sent you a document with some change wording for bylaws. I seem to have lost my cover page. Oh, um, Are you able to share your screen, Judy, or I can share. Would be helpful. What what we did last when we let me give some background here. Um, when when we passed the battery storage facility section of the bylaw, we made battery storage feasible in solar in. I'm sorry, in, in the solar bylaw, we added the battery storage component so that it could be done in certain solar facilities. What we then created a problem because if you go to the non residential use section of the bylaws, it says that you can't do uses which involve hazardous materials anywhere, period. Well, wait so a we're second, saying it says you can do it by special permit in commercial, industrial, and industrial. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, thank you. Um, so we've created a problem where we say in one section of the bylaws, you can do it, in another section, you can't. And, this is a housekeeping problem. 
uh, there are two ways to fix this. One is to take the battery storage facility out of the solar bylaw. I think that that would mean that we have overly restricted the solar bylaw in the way that the violates the state exemption. So I'm not sure that that's an option. So I thought the other thing you could do to fix this conflict would be to allow hazardous materials. And I didn't, or to, to qualify this restriction so it doesn't apply where you have adequate containment and overflow provisions. That would, it, that would still mean that you couldn't do things like trucking or slaughter, well, maybe slaughterhouses, but, um, but if you could do it if, if you properly contained it. I said that this, these would need to be approved by the CONCOM and the Board of Health and obviously haven't talked with them about this. But I think it would solve the problem of the conflict with the solar battery storage. So, and as I said, this is just a housekeeping change to try and avoid a problem. And then, except that the next one, the aquifer overlay district, I think having made that adjustment to the to the non-residential uses, then you have the problem. I don't think you even want to do it allow that in the aquifer overlay district, which is the next step, but anyway, one step at a time. So I found myself, at, at one point I thought I understood the problem and saw the conflict, Judy, but, but maybe I've spent too much time reading and rereading this and I've really kind of come to no longer understand the problem. So let me see if, so, Right now, we have a bylaw for solar electric generating facilities. And in the table of use, these ground mounted solar generating facilities, you know, above a certain size, are allowed everywhere except AR1 by special permit and a site plan review. And these ground mounted solar power generating facilities may per the bylaw contain battery electric storage systems. I mean, they're it's not defined, but they're but battery can be part of that use as defined by the bylaw. And so you seem to be saying, if I understand you right, that well, if a solar facility comes along and says we want to do this in AR2, say, um, and we're gonna have battery storage and our principal use is a ground mounted solar power generating facility that somehow somebody's gonna say, no, you can't do that because of this other row in the table of use for non-residential uses that there will be saying, well, yeah, you are solar, you're a solar facility and solar facilities can have battery storage but, oh, by the way, you're a non-residential use and your battery storage, which is part of your principal use, is involving hazardous materials, so we say, and therefore it's not permitted in AR2. And I'm having a hard time understanding that scenario. It's like multiple roads can be sort of cherry picked. Like I thought somebody would say, I am a, solar, you know, a large, I'm a ground mounted solar power generating facility. There we are. So I can do this in AR2 by special permit. So help me understand the problem you're trying to correct here. Why do we, why is this housekeeping, quote unquote, housekeeping? If you're change? the ZBA, if you're the Zoning Board of Appeals, and it says in one part of the bylaws that this can be done, and in another part of the bylaws, it says that it can't be done. I think you've left them with a dilemma. 
The other interpretation is you can have a ground mounted battery storage system as long as it doesn't involve any hazardous uses, except that I don't think that's a feasible option at this point in time. So I think we are trying to make, make life easier for the ZBA and to correct, and I don't think we intended, if we had known, if we had been aware of the section in the bylaw when we amended the battery store, when we added the battery storage, I think we would have changed it then. We didn't so focus on that. I have two questions. One is, do we have an opinion from the ZBA that they consider that they would have such a dilemma? No. And then two sort of related questions or one your notion that these kinds of dilemmas could exist. So for example, our bylaws, let's take an absurd example, they, they prohibit adult entertainment anywhere. Would it be possible if I could come up with a adult entertainment use that involved hazardous materials somehow. I don't know how I would do this, but I'm creative. That now I could come before the ZBA and say, hey, I've got this non-residential use that involves hazardous materials and nudity. So I'd like a special permit and I'm gonna do this in a industrial zone. Like I'm trying to understand why you think I think that anybody going for a solar facility under our bylaw runs the risk of being denied the ability to do that because an opponent will argue that it has hazardous materials and therefore should not be allowed. And I think the ZBA would probably have to accept that. Hmm. It's a secondary it. condition, just as, um, well, there's, there's a prohibition for light industry about you can't do it if, if there's water discharge into the ground. If the MCTC got approval, went to for an application and they're processing, they might be able to do they might be allowed under one provision if, if the bylaw is changed to allow them to do it in the commercial district, but they couldn't do it if they were discharging water into the ground. I mean, they operate together, these things. Hmm. Well, I, I suppose I still would rather not imagine. I don't know enough about what the zoning board does, does not do, what their experience is. I'd like to hear that opinion from the ZBA as to whether they consider this scenario um, significant. Um, if it's really about, I mean, it, you know, then, how could they I, not? How could they not? It's written there that you can't do it. And to some extent, it's our job to make sure there aren't these little loopholes so that it's easier for the zoning board to enforce yeah. the zoning. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I'm still puzzled that uh, an opponent would be able to stop a, a solar facility containing uh, battery storage by bringing up this particular aspect of the- It's always, all, all of zoning is mutually dependent. I mean, you can't do something, it could say battery storage, but this is a bad example. Um, you can build a warehouse, but if it if it violates the lot coverage requirement, you can't do it. 
I mean, it's it's not just it's not just what the table of use says. It's all of the zoning together works works for approval. That's why it's important to have the aquifer yeah. overlay district on the map so that you take account of everything. I get that. I mean, the aquifer overlay district is a. So let's let's suppose. So now the question is your language here under non-residential uses. Is this because it it seems like it's motivated entirely by concerns about battery storage in solar facilities, but it's doing some very different things here. So it is really the issue that this made us realize like, oh, um, we need to clean up this row in non-residential uses. I mean, we started thinking about it because of battery storage, but now we really want to allow non-residential uses involving hazardous materials unless they have appropriate containment facilities. So this is really not about battery storage. This is about making, um, just improving the way we deal with non-residential uses involving hazardous materials. I wouldn't phrase it quite that way. I would say that this, I was trying to come up with a reasonable condition where the any of the risks of these materials could be mitigated. Well, hmm. I mean, I sort of feel funny about making a change to a bylaw intending to address something involving battery storage where the change makes no mention of batteries or batteries. It's not, it would not be limited to battery storage. Yeah. It's comma coincidentally battery storage. Yeah. So yes. It would so certainly have to apply generally. And and I think I think the more reasonable question or the maybe the more pertinent question is whether this is adequate containment or adequate protection. So I think if I were explaining this at town meeting, I wouldn't even talk about battery storage except as maybe an example. No, I think you have to explain it as why we're doing this because otherwise, um, why why would you why would you weaken a bylaw? And I think you just presented as housekeeping, which basically it is. But it's housekeeping if we do it right that leaves leaves the protection adequate. And I think we want to focus on whether this is adequate or not. Hmm. Well, I think that I think it's adequate, and it gives, as you said, the the ZBA uh, the flexibility to make a good decision. So okay, and so we need, we need, need to vote on this. Do we need to take a vote on it? I think this is just discussion at this point. Yeah. Well, it seems like we definitely need to hear from the Conservation Commission and the Board of Health. Well, yeah, we have to decide whether we want, whether we think it's worth doing and then get input from them. One, whether they're willing to be involved and two, whether, whether um, this, this is adequate. I'll say that I think my preference, if we're primarily concerned about battery storage, then the best way, the most, the way that makes it clear is to A, define what we mean by battery storage. It's not defined at all anywhere in anywhere in the zoning bylaws period. 
the term battery storage appears deep down in the solar electric generating facility bylaw with no definition. And the, the bylaw addresses setbacks. It addresses um, a couple of other issues about battery storage. Um, if, if we're going to take this approach to fixing it, I don't think it should be limited to battery storage. And I don't think, uh, period. Because then you, you're, well, why would you do it for them and not for something else? Yeah. But so, it would include battery storage storage. Yeah, it would include. Okay. I agree with Judy. And, and so let me just make sure here because, so this would still right now, solar, let's see if I play this out. So right now, solar is allowed anywhere. Let's just say the large, the large solar mount, solar facilities, but anywhere in town except AR1 by special permit. And what the effect of this would be, I think, is to restrict, so any solar facility that had battery storage would meet this definition, but only be allowed by special permit in the commercial, industrial, and industrial zone. So we would say solar, could, big solar could be anywhere except AR1 without battery storage. No, no, no. With battery storage no. only in- You're reading it wrong. No, that's, not, that's not what it says. Okay. What this does is mean that what this exemption does is, or this addition, means that it doesn't apply to battery storage at all. But yeah, this whole thing about it is or is not battery storage. I mean, if one added a definition of battery storage to the solar bylaw, then you could change this to just say, except Except no, we wouldn't storage. want to do that because it, there's no reason to exempt battery storage alone. Mm -hmm. Either this is a reasonable, either this is a reasonable protection against for hazardous materials. We, we're assuming that that we are somehow still presenting preventing mm -hmm. risk from hazardous materials. Um, and, and that should be general. It shouldn't be specific to any one instance. The reason we have to do it is because of another, of a particular battery storage thing. If it had been, I don't know, vanilla cake making, it wouldn't matter. But I don't think you want to mention battery storage here, here at all. Yeah. So how does this solve the original problem? So somebody presents solar with battery storage in AR2, and now an opponent says, oh, it, it has, it includes battery storage, which means it's got it involves hazardous materials by some claim. And we're gonna say, oh no, this doesn't apply only if the applicant, the solar applicant has designed their system to provide containment facilities with adequate overflow for the battery storage. Is that the way this would play out? We're sort of, sort of under the covers regulating how battery storage? Well, the battery storage already already requires the containment facilities. How so? It's in the bylaw. Where? Let me just make sure because I saw 
It may yes. not mention overflow because we hadn't, I hadn't heard of that until I know it doesn't. So I see in section six of the solar bylaw hazardous materials does say about, yeah, it does say hazardous materials shall, and then it says something about containment. It doesn't say anything about approvals of. Where's function. the battery? If you look at the battery storage section. Battery storage section. Where? What do you call the battery storage section of the solar electric bylaw? I see batteries mentioned under dimension size and height requirements. Setbacks for large scale battery this storage. This is the part we added. I see under hazardous materials two paragraphs one that mentions any associated battery storage systems may not be located. In, and it says the storage system must be located within a building. So there is a paragraph here that speaks to requirements for the battery storage system. So there it is. So, so that's where it is. It's under hazardous materials in the bylaw. So that regulates. What page? What page you on? Yeah. I'm on. Well, on my paper copy. I'm looking at page eighty-eight. Yeah. But it's the second paragraph. The system these. must be located within a building with the following features: and temperature and humidity, da da da, an impervious floor with a containment system. For potential leaks of hazardous materials. Right. And so even if they do that, you're claiming they could still be opposed and challenged with this other part of the bylaw. Is that, if it's just me that's being obtuse here, then I'll just stand down. I think you should stand up. I take my guidance from the chair. Okay. So I think we've probably looked at solar bylaw as well. It's kind of in that last discussion. So the new thing is this cannabis social clubs, which is. Uh up for grabs. Well, there's also if we do if we do the change to the hazardous materials, then we have to think about is that adequate protection for the aquifer overlay district. So I would propose adding still banning uh, any form of commercial or large scale battery sort storage facility in the aquifer overlay district. Good idea. Good idea. Yes. And it it's not it's not specifically banned there now. Um, I I'm not comfortable with the word commercial. I thought non-residential, but then I thought that gets kind of messy. Talked to Chris Kellogg just before the meeting. Um, he says that residential battery storage backup systems tend to be, what, 10 kilowatt. Um, he thought a maximum of 15 or 20 would be generous. So maybe we could just say larger than 20 kilowatt would be banned in, in the aquifer overlay district. I think um, we should confirm that size. About that. I have a 12.5 kilowatt battery and I'm not in the aquifer overlay district, but I only got half the battery system that I could have at the time. The battery, the residential battery market is evolving rapidly. Yeah. Uh, I think one could define 
Well, I think this needs a little bit more work because also battery storage can reasonably be included in commercial enterprises or, um, you know. Yeah, well, that's that's why I, that's I not prefer serving, a slide. Yeah, that's not you serving the the grid or a utility scale. Yeah, well, maybe maybe even something like fifty kilowatts to allow. But what you're really trying to do is prevent these big mega meg, mega storage things in the in the aquifer overlay district. I'm, I'm happy to reach out to Northeast Solar that did my battery and has been making battery storage a main part of their, big part of their business to see if they could provide any feedback on a, upper, a reasonable upper limit for a battery that would be used normally by residences and commercial businesses for self-consumption and you know, battery backups and power outages and so forth, but not be so large as to be primarily used for serving the grid. And I think to allow for some growth and obviously there with electric vehicles and I'm sure there will be other, yeah, I can other that. uses and people are gonna want lar larger systems. Yeah, I think we need to build that flexibility into it but with the understanding that it, we can't have anything large in the aquifer overlay. So the Cannabis Social Club, um, we did get an opinion from town council today that, that he thinks that our existing bylaw would adequately preclude um, Cannabis Social Club. So I think that that one can be omitted and we, if and when cannabis licenses do become allowed, evidently at that point, the town would be able to have a referendum on whether they want them or not, want social clubs or not. Um, if, the, if the town says yes, then a bylaw would be drafted and we could then adjust this marijuana retailer one to exclude on-site consumption, but I think we can skip it now. Uh, did you see what the owners of the castaways were talking about? I was about? afraid you were going to bring that up. <laughs> it looks like that's what they plan on. I think they got the cart way before the horse. Yeah, I agree. They got a long way to go. Yes. You guys might want to check the zoning. Hmm. All right, fill us in, Judy, please. It's on AgRes One marijuana dispensaries aren't allowed there. Good, that's true. Uh, yeah, because that's what I asked for. All right, uh, moving ahead, uh, update on the CPC. Oh, so let's let's circle back. Um, I'm going to contact the the CONCOM and the Board of Health and see if they're willing to live with that first bylaw. If they have any suggested improvements, is that right? Yes. And Brand is going to check on size of battery storage. Yes. Okay. Do you really want the CIPC update? Um, I'll be quick. Why don't you email it to us? Okay, I'm happy to do that. I've written it all up. It's in the folder anyway, so I'll just email it to you. Um, that would be good. And I haven't seen any minutes for approval. Um, additional items not anticipated. Um, Judy, you want to... Uh, Talk about the Whitley School 
No. Which one? I uh, think the, the blue school, I think we've sent feedback to them that they need to provide a lot of additional details. Um, and uh, Lynn is gonna not process their check. We may have to, at what point having stamped, well, as long as we don't sign as having received the application, the, the constructive approval clock isn't ticking, is that right? I think it's ticking, but we can still keep it going to ask for more information or. Okay. okay. So I've sent that in that request and I will correspond with the applicant to try to elicit everything that we need to actually do a site plan with you. Yeah, so we need a site plan review because of the change of use. He's gonna make this into residential. And I think basically he's trying to show us that the parking is gonna stay very similar to what it is and that he's gonna be putting a dumpster in. And Everything else is going to be quote green space unquote. It's it's a very complex project. I don't know how many apartments he's talking now. Initially, he was talking about ten apartments there. So things like septic and parking. I think his applications nine upscale apartments. And I'm sorry. No, I think you're, um, what I read that he's saying nine nine units. So. So it's, it's a big project. I think, I think we need a lot more information. Yeah. Well, it's not gonna make a, a big um, impact on the site itself, the, the building itself. No. I think so do, nine do need... apartments in there? Yeah, it's gonna be. I... It's, I'm not even sure what, what zoning provision he's applying under. Yeah, I think the, the, the really important thing is, is with nine apartments in there, we're gonna be very concerned about septic. Yeah. But- um, The septic isn't even on his property, is it? Well, it's he all one lot now. He owns both lots. That's good. <laughs> Parking and traffic and, you know, it's not lighting. Yep. Okay. I'm good with that. Any items that we would like to talk about other than that? Maybe we should schedule our next meeting for the a month from now instead of for the 29th that would give us if people are free yeah we're free. Wow. that would give us a little more wiggle room to get we have to advertise for public hearings and stuff so you mean on the 22nd of march judy yeah 21st Versus... 22nd it's Thank wednesday you. Yes, I'm like that we're on Wednesdays. So the 24th? Oh, no, that's May. No, the 22nd of March, Wednesday. Can you do that, Mary? I should be able to. All right, so we will not meet on the 29th, or at least if we do, we'll discuss that on the 22nd. Sounds good. Okay. That can work for me. Entertain a motion to adjourn. Second. Uh, all right. I will make mine a motion to adjourn then. Yay. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. The, meeting, the meeting is adjourned.